Today I'm going to be harvesting the last of the lead white. Um, I've already processed some of it, but it's uh, end of, or I guess very beginning of October. So uh, you kind of need hot weather in order to make it. And so I've let it go kind of its full course and I'm going to collect the rest of it and then process that and see how much I got total. Um, I started it around mid-July. Um, and so I'm anticipating maybe around 700 grams, 750 grams. Um, and then trying to up that up to like two kilos next year. But I have a couple tubs of it. And so I'll talk about the process once I get there to show you. Um, but you definitely want to do this uh, if you have a little bit of land. If you're in a, in a neighborhood and you had a bunch of tubs like this and, you know, I'm wearing gloves and a mask and I would be worried that the HOA is going to show up at your house if, if you're, you know, doing poking around things in a, mask and gloves in the neighborhood um, but this is nice that i have some lands here that i can do this at um, and so one of the things you need is horse manure which i was able to get just looking on craigslist and i found a place uh, like a kind of a farm a couple miles from my house that i was able to just stop by and take a couple of buckets full um, so this is kind of my setup here and looks like there's some flies going around it. So let me get the tripod set up and then we'll dive into it. And so if you're watching this video, I would assume you've already known, you know, like why you would want to do this um, and kind of the basics of lead white. But uh, basically the process is that uh, this is how it was historically done. And so it's horse manure re reacting with an acid and it produces carbon dioxide, which oxidizes the lead. And so this is kind of the setup I have. Um, I'm making sure I'm wearing gloves and I'm gonna make sure I have a face mask also. Um, it's important to know because lead can be dangerous. Hopefully you can still hear me with this on. Um, lead can be dangerous. So it's just like knowing how to work with it so that you can do it safely. Um, and so when it's in kind of this stage, the, the, the powder, since it's turned into it, it's oxidized and turned into a, a powder this is what you could ingest and then this would be really toxic. Uh, so let's see if I can show you. I'll actually let's get one that's going a little bit better. So my setup is basically, um, it's a little dirty because it's been going for a couple months, but I have a glass jar and I bought little glass gar jars in it, or that I set inside of it. And so basically these little glass jars are holding up this piece of lead um, so that's not actually directly touching the acid that I kind of poured in the bottom in the jar and kind of around the edge. And so this reacts, um, the acid kind of evaporates, comes up and interacts with the, the horse manure. And it basically causes it to oxidize super quickly. And I was able to buy the sheet light on Amazon and then I just had a, had a chop saw that just like actually cut right through the lead. Um, and so that was pretty easy. And then I just kind of brushed it with um, um, acetone uh, because there's normally like a protective coating on it just to kind of strip that away. Um, and then you just cover it up and let it go. Um, and then that's why you really need the heat in order to get it to work. So that can cause that chemical reaction. So I have these tools that are specifically for lead white. I'm not mixing it. All the stuff I'm using here is not getting repurposed or reused for anything else. Just because of how toxic it is uh, to ingest it, I'm just keeping it all separate. And so at this point, I'll use my pliers and pull out a sheet, level, a sheet lead that's all covered in a, in a what's going to be processed into lead white. And then this is where you really want to make sure you have a mask on because you see particles are kind of getting everywhere. But I'm just kind of hammering it. And the lead is just literally just flaking off, um, which is kind of where flake lead, just sometimes used synonymously with lead white, that, that uh, term comes from. What's so cool about this is the the oxidation process the the amount of lead you have to start with you'll get uh, I guess 
ooh, it would be theoretically maybe even a bit more. But, you know, if I have around 10 kilos, geez, of lead white. I don't know why this bee won't leave me alone. Okay, I think the bee is gone now. That was really weird. Um, and so what I was saying is the the weight of lead you have is how much lead white you can potentially get from it. Um, and so I have, I think this is something around 10 kilos, maybe, maybe a little more. Um, and so the potential yield for that and lead white would be about the same. Um, so I can kind of open it and kind of hit it on the inside. So I'm actually, after I'm done with all these, I'll leave them in the sheet lead and, um, you know, you don't have to worry about anything going bad or anything. You can just leave it all there and start it up next summer once it's hot. Just get some new horse manure and uh, refresh the acid, which you can just use like vinegar. And then you're good to go. Um, so after I've kind of hit that quite well, um, you can kind of coil it back up again. See if I can get it to fit. So I'm just going to leave everything back in. And so I'm just going to go through each one and see how much sheet lead we can collect. And it weighed about 3.2 pounds, which was about three pounds more than I thought we were going to get. This is the uh, lead that I've already processed. And so you can see it's kind of in kind of clusters. It's this little bit in here is 500 grams. Um, I guess I probably shouldn't be switching metric and standard so much. Um, but yeah, I guess 3.2 pounds is, is what? I don't know. So maybe I can get around two kilos or three and a half, three and a half pounds of the stuff. So that is, is a lot more than I thought I was going to get originally. So I'll set that aside. So this is a giant, um, uh, like granite molar. It's like used for salsa or something. I bought it on Amazon for like 30 bucks and I've left it all dirty just so I have, um, just so I don't waste any any of the lead white. So I can just, as I keep processing the next batch, I can kind of re-institute that and kind of uh, try to have less loss of the lead. Um, so I'm putting my gloves again because, um, you know, the most dangerous aspect of it is when it's in pigment form, particle form, because you can ingest it and you can get it on your hands, under your nails. And then, you know, if you eat while you have that on there, then you get it in your system that way. So there is uh, a lot of different ways you can ingest it. But uh, once it's in paint form, it's a lot safer because um, the only way to really ingest it is to eat it. And so to have it on your hands and then touch like, you know, eat an apple or something like that without properly washing. So that's more kind of straightforward um, of how to avoid that. And so you're going to see a big plume of kind of dust of very, very, very toxic dust kind of come up. So this is where I want to make sure I always have a mask on also. And so I'm going to pour some of this beautiful lead white. And you can see there's some things that are slightly kind of discolored. That's the, uh, the trace metals that can be in the lead. And that's what will come out um, in addition to kind of grinding it down here um, with just water. 
it will also kind of pull off the trace minerals or trace metals. And so I'm kind of pouring some in and then I'm going to get some water. I always like to kind of keep this as scientific as possible. So I'm using uh, some uh, refined or filtered water. Just because I live on a well and so there can be minerals and other things in that that I don't really want. I'm going to add all that water and mix it around and it's going to break down. And so this basically converts it from the uh, like the flakes uh, of, of the metal that kind of form the outside and have flake off. It breaks it down, but this is one of the big differences between commercially made lead white that is not made from oxidizing exactly. It's 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 kind of made in a process that uh, basically creates these particles that are homogenous. They're all the same size, and with this, we're grinding it down. Some are getting grind down to a very fine particle. Others are staying quite coarse, and so that variety is what gives this Dutch stack method lead white uh, a special characteristic in terms of its handling properties and then also like its strength when it dries. Um, a good analogy that I've I read while I was researching this is I guess the difference between um, building, building a wall with uh, stones that are all the same size versus stones of all different sizes. And if you think of it as being one stone deep, um, the, the wall that's made with stones of all the same size would be much easier to push over than one that's made with big stones and then small stones kind of pressed in the crevices and all different size stones. It kind of creates a special sort of strength. Um, and so that's, that's ultimately one of the big differences in addition to it being non-adulterated. So it's much kind of heavier and pure. And so you need a lot less kind of linseed oil, which, uh, will help the longevity of the painting. So it doesn't take too long, I've found, to get it into a good consistency. Um, and then I'm just going to keep adding some more pigment. And this is way more than I had last time I processed it, so I will have to do this in batches. Um, but I think I can add a little bit more without it being kind of too thick. <laughs> And then we're going to let this sit. I'm going to add a little more water so there's a bit more kind of separation between the, the particles that have settled down to the bottom because lead is so heavy it will, it will stay at the bottom. And then kind of these trace metals that will kind of become liquefied and kind of reside in the water that we can pour off. And this water oftentimes I've noticed kind of this really pretty like blue kind of blue green tint um, that comes through from that trace the trace metals um, my guess would be probably copper um, but but this water is extremely toxic and so I have what I, which I'll show you I have a pot that's spe uh, specifically for this toxic waste that we make from this lead white because like I live on a well and so anything that I put in the ground I'm just going to be drinking and so I really don't want this stuff in the ground and so basically putting it in a pot and then leaving it out in the sunlight, it will evaporate, all the water will evaporate, and it will basically be much more kind of condensed down. And so you don't have to worry about it getting into the ground, especially if you live on a well. Pouring more water and kind of wash this off a little bit. And then we'll leave that to settle and come back to that. Um, it shouldn't take more. I'll probably let it go for an hour or two and check back in it and see how separated it is. And then we'll process that a bit further.
Okay, so I've let this sit for quite a while and it's actually all sunk into the bottom even though it doesn't look like it, but there's some like really fine white particles that got kind of stuck uh, in these little air bubbles that are still there. Um, but like 99.9% .9 of it has sunk into the bottom and I can see there's like a, a huge gap of water. So I'm going to take this and then this is kind of my runoff kind of uh, toxic waste. And I'm going to slightly kind of pour that off. And you probably can't tell, but there is that blue color I was talking about. And if you do this really slow, the lead is so heavy it will stay down there. And now I'm using this another mason jar that I used last time to filter filter it off. So I'm just reusing that since it's uh, it doesn't have any other purpose. And this was the microfiber cloth. And uh, there's a lot of kind of lead white that kind of dried in it. And so it's quite kind of stiff. Um, and so I, this is the part of the process that I need to figure out a better way to do this next year, especially with the quantity that I have now, because it's quite time consuming. Because um, you essentially have to let the, the water, gravity pull the water off and leave the pigment suspended um, in the microfiber. But if you squeeze it to try to expedite the process, the pigment will kind of seep through the microfiber. And so you really just have to let this go. Um, I use a hair tie um, to hold that all in place. Let's see if that's going to stay. Oop, nope. And what I like about using a hair tie and using a mason jar and microfiber towels, these are all things that uh, I don't have to try to clean up afterwards. I can leave them in the state that they're in, and if they become unusable, I can toss them. Because this stuff, it really doesn't clean up. Okay. So now I'm going to have a little bit of room to pour in some water. Um, I like to take like a palette knife and just kind of mix it all up so it's suspended. It will kind of fall out of that pretty quickly. Um, and back to the bottom, but if you can kind of suspend it a little bit, it makes it kind of easier to pour into it. Um, then I'm just going to take this and kind of pour it in and watch very carefully for when it gets filled up so I don't overfill it. And just like that. And then basically, um, I keep... I can add in some of the kind of stuff that sunk to the bottom like that. And then once the water kind of comes out of it over the course of a couple hours, I can take the hair tie off and very, very lightly. So I'm not pressing all the pigment through the microfiber, but just to kind of expel the last little bits of water, I can kind of push that through. Okay. So I actually let this sit overnight. Um, but I took the last of the, the lead that was in uh, my grinder and put that into the towel, my microfiber towel, as the water kind of got reduced and kind of got, uh, you know, if you can see it, but kind of on the bottom of that there. Um, and so that has pretty much dried as much as it can, and I'm ready to kind of take that out and kind of form it into a clump and put it on a paper plate. And then I put the last, last of the lead uh, into here, and grinded it up quite a bit um, and you can see the blue I was talking about and so that's like the the metals that we want to get out of that we don't want that blue to be left on there um, so we'll pour that off and then I also um, I just kind of mixed up a little bit of the the stuff that I already had done just to make sure that I, I had grinded it enough uh, I was slightly concerned that maybe it was gonna be a little too coarse after kind of rewatching the video I made yesterday um, but it was perfect, and so we are all good to go. And so this is where things get kind of messy. 
um, which also means that I'm losing some of the lead white. So this is going to be something that I'm going to try to streamline a little bit better. Um, but this worked the first time when I did it with that little batch. So I'm just going to do that again for now and then kind of figure out how I can improve that later on. So I have a paper plate that I actually used the last time. So there's still a lot of kind of lead white residue on it, um, which is going to be good because hopefully kind of reduce some of the loss that way. And so I'm just going to carefully kind of take off this hair tie. And now I have a nice kind of clump of lead white. It's still very, very wet, but it's kind of been done draining. I'm going to kind of lightly kind of press it together. And then I'm going to try to kind of open it up and kind of scrape it off of the towel, which is actually coming off very nicely. And now I have a big clump of lead white, which I'm going to try to touch it as little as possible since it's kind of pulling up some lead white every time I touch it. Um, but that chunk is going to be way too big. It will never dry. Um, so I'll take a palette knife to kind of reduce the amount of loss and kind of chop it up a little bit into chunks. Okay, so it actually feels moldable enough. Sometimes I kind of pour it out where it's not, it's still quite liquidy, um, but it still kind of forms little clusters, but this is very nice to work with. And so I'm just going to kind of cut through it like a, I mean, it's almost like a really dense mozzarella ball into these kind of clumps that will dry a little faster. And it's now you don't really get any of the characteristics of lead white when it's suspended in water. It's only when you add it to oil that it becomes, uh, you know, uniquely lead white. So right now it's not, you know, stringy or anything like that. It's just kind of like a clumpy, pigment. So probably good sized chunks. This is also where, you know, now that it's October, the days, I mean, it will be sunny coming up this week. So I'll probably try to cover it up and kind of leave it outside um, so that the sun can kind of evaporate it. Actually have some extra kind of sheet lead that I didn't end up using for lead white, I might put those underneath the paper plate to kind of absorb the sun and kind of reflect the heat back into it to try to expedite that drying process. Okay, so I wanted to show you guys something pretty cool. I put um, some commercially available lead white and then the lead white I made, I smashed it up and put in this. So they're both completely full. And just to kind of do a weight test to see um, so I'm just taking this empty jar just to cancel that out. And then with the commercially available one, uh, I got 44.75 grams. And then let's see if we can get this. And this one's over 100 of the stuff I made. And it's still kind of big particles. I haven't broken it down as much as the other one is. And so there's a lot of air in that one still, but you can see there's a huge difference. I mean, over twice as heavy for what is technically, you know, they would in, have indistinguished from each other. So you can see how it is quite a big difference. Uh, another thing I've noticed is that the, this is the commercially available stuff is a bit kind of more bleached out. It's a bit wider. This has kind of a gray tint to it. I think as I've broken it down, it's been getting wider and wider. So I think a lot of it is once I get it uh, with the molar, once I keep breaking it down, I think it will get a bit lighter. Um, but I think that's also just the fact that, um, that it's pure lead white and this probably has a little bit of zinc um, or, or something to kind of bleach that and make it a little more vibrant. So now I'm going to make up a little batch of each of the lead white and we can kind of see how, uh, how it behaves, the actual kind of characteristics of it. So I'm using the same oil for both of them. Um, this is just a, a clarified and purified um, cold pressed linseed oil. Um, that's also been done uh, like a historic course, historically how it was done historically. And so it's very, very pale. Um, and it's also not subject to 
darken as much as some of the other things are that um, were done with chemicals or through a more kind of harsh process. So I've just kind of put a little bit in. And now I, I make most of my colors and they all kind of behave differently when you get, you know, the, the true colors and they're not just like in the tube uh, and sta stabilized. Uh, and so when you do them yourself, you kind of get the individual characteristics of the different pigments. And so with lead white, you really want to use it. It's, it's very lean. You don't need very much oil in it. I think it's like nine parts per 100, uh, which is one of the leaner ones. And so you really just have to get it kind of clumpy and then you can mold that into uh, it being smooth. Whereas some of the other pigments like ivory black, uh, you, you want it to be almost more liquidy. And then as you mold it, it gets kind of tighter and more uh, kind of, um, it kind of thickens as the paint kind of absorbs into it. With lead white, it's the opposite. It starts kind of chunky and kind of coarse. And then as you mold it, it becomes more and more kind of flexible. This is kind of a good consistency to, to start mulling it. And if I find that it loosens up even too much, I can always kind of add a bit more kind of pigment in there. I can already see it loosening up. I'm going to add a little bit more pigment in there. So if I wanted to get really scientific, I would probably do like a pre-measured amount of pigment and oil for each of these that are the same so that I could have, uh, like, you know, it couldn't be any more than a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, but I'm just going to try to get each of these to the, the best consistency that I can. Um, and so I guess we're not really taking into account uh, the variation in oil, just kind of like what's the best it can do. So you can kind of see a little bit the stringiness of this. So normally when I'm using this stuff, I might actually kind of mull in a little bit of stand oil. And that really kind of helps with the stringiness. Even a little bit of like chalk or marble dust I've found helps also. Um, just because, I don't know, whatever is kind of added in here, it kind of kind of prevents it. Um, but when you kind of mix it around and kind of soften it up, which is what it's going to be like when you let it sit for a bit, it kind of opens it up to be stringy. Okay, now I'll try this other stuff. So I've already kind of mashed 
mashed it from the bigger pieces into slightly smaller pieces. This is going to take a bit more work to get it to be grind up. I ended up spending a lot more time and I made like a whole large tube of this lead white. I used all of it that I had from the first batch that I prepared. Um, and I just wanted to get this uh, enough to make a tube out of it. But I have um, both the, the commercial stuff and then the stuff I made. Um, and so this would be a, kind of a good um, way to kind of judge them. Um, one thing I've noticed is that uh, the commercial stuff kind of sits up a little bit more. It's a it has a it's a easier to form kind of like peaks on it. Um, I think it's because it's lighter, so it kind of has less gravity kind of pulling it down. Um, this lead white, like I can't get it much taller than this because it's so heavy that it kind of pulls itself down, um, which I think would be kind of nice to have it kind of melt melt in together uh, on a painting. Um, and so just again to kind of compare, um, this stuff has been resting for a couple of hours, and so it's gotten more kind of elastic. So this is. I mean, I would consider this really nice. This is good stuff to, this is like, it looks like this is good to work with. Um, that's the stuff I would normally use. Um, but then just to see kind of the difference um, on how kind of tall uh, you can get these peaks. It's very, very, very stringy compared to this, which this is still uh, surprisingly I was, able, I was quite happy with how I was able to get this. Um, but it's just much kind of thinner and just not quite as kind of tall as you can get with, with this. Um, this should also dry faster just because there's more lead in it. Okay. Um, and I'm curious to see what other kind of characteristics it has when I'm painting with it, such as like transparency um, and just how it kind of behaves with the brush. Um, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to tube the rest of this and then maybe I'll show a video of, uh, using it a little bit on a painting. Okay. So these are two self portraits that I'm working on currently. Um, and I'll show you some close ups and some of the textures that I got with that lead white. Um, you can see there's some that I can, I can just kind of sculpt by putting on kind of thickly. Um, and then kind of like following the form to kind of get some of those brush marks. And then I also have some kind of like, I guess more kind of splotchy, kind of thick marks. You can get kind of like really thin streaky marks, adding a little bit of oil. And then this was fun. Um, so this was kind of applying it kind of thickly and then taking a fan brush and kind of waving it up. Um, little pings of highlights off the nails and so there's a lot of kind of cool textures you can get built up um, here I applied it really thickly on the book and then used the back of a brush the point to kind of scribble into it and remove that um, to kind of give an impression from a distance of some kind of faint words on a page um, and so there's a lot of different kind of variety you can do um, both kind of thinly adding it and then also kind of thickly and boldly putting it on. Um, and so, yeah, I've been playing around with that on this painting um, and trying to think of like sculpting it, even like here kind of applying uh, a flesh tone made with the white and then taking the back of the brush and kind of scraping away at it. So there's a, there's a lot of variety with like both like additive and kind of subtractive approaches to it. So I hope that kind of helps. Um, yeah, so that's that's the whole project of going from sheet lead to to uh, finished paintable um, lead white. So you can see here, my pad's a little dirty because I took the fan brush and I was tapping it in. Um, so I would normally want to keep that cleaner. Um, but yeah, that's that's it.